We will begin uh, with our open mic. Mark, Mark Walsh. Please welcome Mark Walsh. Hello, everyone. I'm going to get myself organized and then demask. OK. So I just have a couple of uh, poems to read today. First one is a sonnet um, about the joys of uh, working out in the backyard. This is called Stacking Wood. The easy part was over. The dull chainsaw reduced the quarter ton bow to liftable logs for the fire pit. Packed with geometry in the wheelbarrow, hauled to the far corner of the yard, then chunked together to form an ordered pile of three up and two back, portions of oak clack into place like drumsticks dropped in a sack. The honesty of this work is a relief. The aches, the lumbered breathing from, the, from stacking wood is an afternoon's clean meditation. Mulling over the duration for proper seasoning before the burn offers measured freedom from the blank quandary of a student with no money for his store of textbooks. The next poem is, was a, uh, for me was a long time coming, and um, it was uh, one uh, that I felt I, I had to write, but I really tried to avoid writing it because it's dealing with um, two subjects I've been trying to avoid. One is uh, 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 personal fear. And the, and the next is, is the loss of a very close friend. And I, I put them all together in, in this poem that I, I have to acknowledge. Uh, uh, Philip really helped me with this one, uh, helped me put it together. And this is called, You Cross the Bridge for the One Down the Road. I'm on speaking terms with bridges, although the conversations are always terse. Behind the wheel, a bridge makes me forget to breathe. They join two unpleasant aspects of life, height linked with no visible exit. To be on one is to be locked into the starkness of a one-way route. 10 seconds of terror upon approach when panic grips down, numbs fingers, causes sight to dim. In silence, I plead with my irrational self not to make a terror of losing control and crashing through the guardrail a real thing. In time, and with help, I have assembled defenses, casual causal moments, left hand firmly on the wheel while the right hand moves from the wheel to shift and shift to wheel, showing freezing anxiety that self-control is alive. Singing helps, remembering lyrics a distraction, as is in gross conversation with my rider, who I remind myself is my charge to deliver safely home. Bigger life providing bigger focus. There are times, however, when alone, I'm left to confront the steel and concrete serpent looming up over the horizon. What then? Years ago, I lost a friend to self-slaughter and needed to drive to Falmouth for the final farewell. Strangely, my anxiety pregame nearly evaporated. The image of the Sagamore dwindled in comparison to the size of my loss the stern gray emptiness my questions could not answer. That trip was accountability, penance, and apology owed for missed calls, canceled plans, and a trash can of dropped balls. The slow boil of anger you shouldn't feel but do never resolves and never quite leaves. He was vital. He worked with people who had lost themselves, working to pull them out of a darkness so he could forget his a darkness he hid so well it took two hours before the cause of death blared in my head like an air raid horn. That morning I pounded the steering wheel and cursed across the length of three New England towns. He was vital, helping me to sort my life out, the gray emptiness forcing me to consider if I ever helped him. Then, around the bend of Route 3, the bridge appeared like some bog beast that chews up spear danes for sport. Twinging fear crept up my spine, my car tilting towards the crest of the Sagamore. I said out loud, peace, little friend. Thank you for your care, but I'm going to say goodbye to Ken. He was vital, 
and we need to pick up his slack. The chill panic warmed and folded in on itself. Today, when bridges need to be crossed, they're crossed for Ken, for the bridges he should be riding on and off the Cape, and he sh as he should be racing triathlons and playing his ukulele and meeting me in Plymouth for moderately priced Tex-Mex. You cross the bridge not to get to the other side, but for, for the bridge further down the road, and you go on crossing bridges, making, making it a thing you do, like remembering a lost lyric or waking up with the alarm. The depth of air under vaulted steel is not for you, not ever for you, because the next bridge is waiting. Thank you. So I, I that was kind of heavy. So I can't go out on that heavy a note. So as I was uh, saying to Philip and, and to Tim a little earlier, um, I was at a family wedding uh, this past weekend down in Austin, Texas, and uh, waiting for the flight home, as is often the case, um, we had an overbooked flight, and then we had all the bartering begin to get the people off the flight. And whenever I'm in that kind of experience, I think of not only the poet laureate of England, but also the poet laureate of airports, Simon Armitage. And uh, I just have to read this poem today because it was on my mind all day Monday. This is called um, Aviators. They'd overbooked the plane. At this moment in time, announced the agent at the counter, Rainbow Airlines is offering 100 pounds or a free return flight to any passengers willing to stand down. A small man in a cheap suit and a Bart Simpson socks scratched his ankle. 150 pounds, she announced 15 minutes later. Nobody moved. 200? From nowhere, this neat looking chap in a blue flannel uh, jacket and shiny shoes loomed over the desk and said, I'll take the money. But you're the pilot, she said, <laughs> then added, sir, as if she'd walk into a Japanese house and forgotten to take her shoes off. The pilot whispered, listen, I need that money. I'm behind on my mortgage payments because my wife's a gambler. I've got two sons at Naval College. And the hats alone cost a small fortune. And I'm being blackmailed by a pimp in Stockport. Let me take the 200 you'd be saving my life. I'd been sitting within earshot next to the stand-up ashtray. Give him the money, I said. Who are you? asked Dorothy. She was wearing a plastic name badge with gold letters. Dorothy, I'm George, I said. And clearly this man's in pain. And I don't want him going all gooey midway over the English Channel. I once heard sobbing coming from the cabin of a jumbo jet at 33,000 feet, and it sounded like the laughter of Beelzebub. But who'll fly the plane, she wanted to know. Why me, of course. I opened my mouth so she could see how good my teeth were, like pilot's teeth. <laughs> Do you have a license, she asked. I said, details, always details. Dorothy, it's time to let go a little, time to trust in the unexplained, time to open your mind to the infinite. By now my hand was resting on hers and a small crowd of passengers had gathered round, nodding and patting me on the back. Good for you, George, said a backpacker with a leather shoelace knotted around his wrist. It was biblical, or like the end of a family film during the time of innocence. And I said, Dorothy, give me the keys to the cockpit and let's get this baby in the air. <laughs> Thank you. and thank you for catching a great, great flight of your poem. And I just want to thank everybody for coming here because, you know, uh, we're in a very thankful giving season and it's most important to acknowledge our friends and family of this community that attends here and those others who are not able but are, watch everyone has a voice routinely. So I want to thank um, everyone for attending and uh, we did have uh, Voices of Diversity. We had a great 
momentum of uh, multi-languages uh, and great poems in a great diversified field. So I'm going to continue forward uh, with the open mic. So I would love to welcome Sheila Twining for you to come up. Yes, and share your lovely poem. I've never seen you with your hair down. I love it. Does it show beautiful? Beautiful, yes. She's like a teenager. <laughs> well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> but it's very nice, though. First poem is called Drought. There is no breeze, and birds fall exhausted, slip into deep, slip into deep crevices in the parched and wrinkled earth. Foxes run in circles, keening sacred harp songs of lament. Marsh reeds play their coda, their grace notes stilled. The greedy sun has drunk its fill from Ursa Major and now eats each cloud with heated fervor. The stillness of days covers the land like a bard, like a bell jar, and inside a susurration, lips moving in prayer. Tonight, the well is dry, but the waning moon clings to the stones, remembering water. And this next one is the throat singer of Tuba. I don't know whether you've all heard of a throat singer or not. <coughs> Excuse me, they're very popular in Mongolia and uh, that, that part of the world. And they're able to sustain a long go like that and then sing on top of it. It's amazing. If you noticed, I can't do it. Um, the throat singer of Tuva. In Siberian steppes and tiger forest that embrace a vast eternal silence, murmurings of insects and beasts, water and wind dissolve into a symphony as Chazia, the herder, sings the sounds of a gurgling stream, the clack of cantering hooves. His voice sustains a long, low drone, as if the earth itself was groaning. He layers another harmonic pitch that resonates high above the drone, like the distant cry of a lone gray wolf or a wistful whistle of the bird overhead. His music cuts and darts through the air. Saget, Carmel, high, sharp tones, garga, low, growling cries of a mother camel after losing her calf. The pulsing and zig layer rhythm of running horses with their heads into the wind. Chazir thumps a kamuz to the drip of melting snow. The wind strums the strings of his chattagon when he places it on the roof of his yurt. And he spins a curly in thanks for the wind's breath. Spirits of nature imbue him with their powers, and he hears and sculpts as he mimics their sounds. The herder sings the light migrating over the landscape, trembling with exhilaration, free of spoken words. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. As I was listening to you, that gave me a great fall feel. <laughs> I'm not sure, it's just your humbleness and the way that you share your poems, but the sleep crescents and foxes running around, spirits of nature, we're in fall season still, it's kind of like a humbly fall feel, so thank you for that. I would like to continue forward. Uh, Joyce Wilson, please come up and share your lovely poem as well. Thank you very much. I'm going to read one poem. This is from a, it's sort of an origin story about a man who arrives in an agricultural community and decides uh, he doesn't want to farm, he wants to play a game. Um, he found the game. At first, no one would mark off field from field in deference to nature's amplitude. Then mischief intervened with choking weeds, unwanted shade, and sudden deadly floods. 
He watched the farmers pushing heavy plows as they advanced through earth in measured rows. But when he saw how far a stone would go as he leaned back and balanced on the ground, how like a meteor by force of will, the ball went out until his brother caught it in midair and sent it back so that it soon returned to harbor in his hand. He marveled at the speed and harmony of form, this back and forth, repeat, again. He found a fairness in the measured game, the structure and the rules, the cool surprise, and joined up with the Negro Baseball League for audiences of farmers just like him. Let nature bring her seasonal delights, excessive storms and disappointing droughts. Across impediments, he'd float the ball to challenge nature to come out and play. Thank you, Joyce. We're going to continue on and we're going to embrace our youth, but I want to take a moment that at times we find that when we go with our mind into one, um, and when we go in, uh, with our minds into one entity or one uh, a mission or something to do, as you shared in the poem, we end up finding that sometimes the uh, forces of nature and sometimes other things get uh, our attraction that we are destined to, to learn, get learn into. And most, he was identifying himself with the audience of farmers like him. And sometimes that's what people do is they find a comfort zone of identifying, finding an identity that they can relate to. So thank you for sharing that poem. That was very lovely. And um, embracing our youth, our lovely Anjali Andre, who has many wonderful poems she has shared with us, will continue to bring the youthfulness of the creative arts in our poetry reading today. Welcome, Anjali. Hi, as you know, my name is Anjali Andre, and um, I like to doodle, so I'm doing that now. Um, so, I have a poem called Random Things, so here it is. Gummy bears, Tesla model, gacha characters. Pencils, pens, poppets, bracelets, watches, fortunes, books, books, and more books. These are just the random things that come to my mind. Some days you get all these ideas that come faster than a track star, then other days you just don't. Track, my friends, school, ELA, math, six hours, done. I don't know what to write. Should I do similes and metaphors? Should I make it a rhyming poem or free verse? Should I be short or long? Please tell me you can relate to the situation. Okay, so what's next? I'll try a different pen. Still didn't work. I wonder what it would be like to shrink yourself. Oh, I have jumbo paper clips, stickers, a sharpener, and a notebook. Well, I guess I'm out of ideas now. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. I was so thinking cute. of my definitely. So I was thinking of my uh, grandson who's eight. He was looking forward to coming and attending here. He would have so loved that because he's inspired. Of, I, mean, I have to buy like boxes of uh, journals in Amazon because he's out doing me in Walmart right now. Because they, they you, you know, they find a way that they can express themselves. It's most important to encourage and empower them because um, writer's block is definitely real. Uh, brain freeze is definitely real, inability to write or express in general uh, outside of creative art and poetry. And I want to thank you for that, Anjali. And most, I just want to thank you, her mom, for always being supportive and attending as well. But yes, the beauty of, um, of our youth or the monthly everyone has a voice, because Anjali is a regular that attends, is the fact that um, I didn't know she had a girl spur, but she's becoming a lovely young lady. And I feel like I've heard the empowerment of her personality come out today. So thank you, thank you. I look forward into who you will become in a future destiny as a young lady. Alrighty, with that being said, we are going to call our next poet, Thomas Kelly, please come up and share. Hello. Uh I feel a little bit embarrassed because I am in no way a poet. In fact, I didn't really plan on doing anything today at all. Uh, I just had a random impulse and decided to follow up on it. 
And so I decided to read the song lyrics to a song that's specifically about having a random thought and following up on it and the follies that entail. So who here remembers the Dublin nurse? You do? Do you? All right, well, this is their song, The Sick Note. Uh, it says here that one of the songwriters was uh, Pat Cooksey, but I've got no way of knowing if that's true or not because I did not research this at all. Like I said, following up on a random thought here. So I'm going to be reading the lyrics to a song. <clears throat> Dear sir, I write this note to you to tell you of my plight. And at the time of writing, I am not a pretty sight. My body is all black and blue, my face a deathly gray. And I write this note to say why Patty's not at work today. While working on the 14th floor, some bricks I had to clear. Now to throw them down from such a height was not a good idea. The foreman wasn't very pleased, he being an awkward sod. So I had to cart them down the ladders in my hod. Now clearing all these bricks by hand, it was so very slow. So I hoisted up a barrel and secured the rope below. But in my haste to do the job, I was too blind to see that a barrel full of building bricks was heavier than me. <laughs> so when I untied the rope, the barrel fell like lead. And clinging tightly to the rope, I started up instead. Oh, well, I shot up like a rocket, and to my dismay I found that halfway up I met the bloody barrel coming down. <laughs> well, the barrel broke my shoulder as to the ground it sped, and when I reached the top, I banged the pulley with my head. Well, I clung on tight, though numb with shock, it from this almighty blow. And the barrel spilled out half the bricks, 14 floors below. <laughs> now when these bricks had fallen from the barrel to the floor, I then outweighed the barrel, and so started down once more. Still clinging tightly to the rope, I sped toward the ground, and landed up on the broken bricks that were all scattered round. Well, as I lay there loaning on the, groaning on the ground, I thought I passed the worst. When the barrel hit the pulley wheel and then the bottom burst. <laughs> well, a shower of bricks rained down on me. I hadn't got a hope. As I lay there moaning on the ground, I let go the bloody rope. <laughs> <laughs> the barrel being heavier, it started down once more and landed right across me as I lay upon the floor. With, I well, it broke three ribs in my left arm, and I can only say. I hope you'll understand why Patty's not at work today. <laughs> awesome. So, think about your random thoughts before you follow up. I continue to encourage you to become spontaneous and for all of us, because spontaneity is definitely needed. Great laughs, great feel. And I totally enjoyed that. And that is part of the arts, because when we think about music and we think about other readers sharing what someone previously wrote and creating it into your own energy, into your own, uh, into your own segment, into your own, as you did, uh, Thomas, very well presenting. That is awesome, because you definitely brought a great uh, swirl of positive laughing energy here. So with that being said, I am going to continue forward in inviting Trish Clinton to come and share your poem. Hi, mine won't be uh, as creative or as funny as Thomas, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. All right. I do not have these titled because I wrote them today, so. All right. I am so confused by the current events. People are homeless, living in tents. But what about the rest of you living in your cushy homes, landscape lawns with garden gnomes? Start a fire that sparks deep within. Forget the shame and all my sin. There's a, no doubt nor denying that Christ is the only way. Other people, places, and things can lead you astray. Fiery flames that don't burn out. Keep your eyes on the prize, push through anxiety and doubt. Carry forth the news that you've come to save. Those of us in bondage, Satan's slave. 
We need to live again, go beyond the grave. Where can you, where you can break the chains that heavily weighed you down? Jesus makes us kings and queens, so please put on your crown. Wear it proud, for you are cut above the rest. Your battle is real, and you've overcome many tests. It's a fight worth fighting, the end result's supreme. You realize this is your best life lived, no longer just a dream. So do it and believe it's the best decision yet. I put $100 on Jesus if I had to place a bet. Now I stand at a crossroads, only two choices I know. Pick the road less traveled, it's the best way to go. It won't be easy, but it'll be well worth the cost. Finding Jesus, all you who are broken, lonely, and lost. Forever I stand on your words of truth and life, never looking back to past humiliation and strife. Let the season be one of giving and of love. It's a time of acknowledging the good Lord above. So change your heart. It's not too late. Don't delay. It's going to be monumental. So add today. Shattered memories on the wall. No one to hold me, no one to call. We want things to go smooth, but rocky is the road we take. Weighed down with guilt over the bad decisions we make. Find the thing that makes us, that takes us out and gets us back on track. Get out of this nightmare, getting a bit of reality back. Will this cycle of abuse ever subside? There's no one to comfort or be helpful or a guide. It's a season of giving, but if you don't do it, what's the sense of living? We all have a purpose on this earth, and I pray that we figure it out. Erase the painful past full of worthlessness and self-doubt. We can do it, get things going, put our best foot forward. We can do it for him, not for accolades or just a reward. In the end, we aren't pleasing people, it's all for the Lord. The world is full of deception and corruption and lies. People suppress their hurts and hide their painful cries. Fighting with each other helps no one. It causes division and strife. Nothing productive can come out of this kind of life. Take the word provided, read it, and take it in. Ask God's forgiveness, repent of all your sin. Let the challenges that bound you now set you free. God's the answer, the way. His truth and mercy is for all of us, can't you see? Find hope in the empty abyss. Let God fill you, warm your heart like a gentle kiss. Remain in him, be steadfast without wavering. Believe that this is, that's really messy. True will will come to pass. I place my anchor firmly on the ground where God's word is truth and faith abounds. Find my way through ashes. It's harder than we're seeing. Stand strong no matter what. Keep on believing. No matter what you've heard, impossibilities is not a word. Take a step out. You can have hope that will never end. Make Jesus your rock, your foundation forever, your friend. Thank you, Trish, for always bringing faith and encouragement and very uh, nice, heartfelt, soulful words. And I say that because uh, faith is what keeps me going. Faith is how I live my life on a daily basis. And uh, with this season, uh, again, uh, and we always had great uh, poems and poetry from in the areas of mental health as well, that we know that sometimes it's very hard, especially even more after the pandemic, where there's family losses, individuals where uh, as she stated in her poem, uh, that may become lonely. And the most encouragement is for everyone is to find something within yourself that brings that life that, that the sun can fall upon and grow that blossom flower even in the winter season, in this holiday season. So now we're gonna continue forward and thank you for your patience. And we have another poet coming forward, Lou Fox. Please come and share.
Thank you. Uh, to echo the tail end of that, I saw a crazy car accident about an hour and a half ago, so tell everyone that you love that you love them. Mm -hmm. um, this poem is called A Mirror's Candor. He has never been fond of my acquaintance. Three years later, and I'm jumping the shark? As his stern hazel eyes starkly spit disregard for my indecision at the dusty, chipped glass, I find myself looking into them, hoping to find a blanket of refuge only to see the person I was to him before he realized I had the romantic intuition of a 16-year-old Turkish boy with nothing but the lyrics of mosquitoes as his guide into American summer nights. You couldn't write a better script myself, he reassured the collecting steam. Not until recently did I come to grips with the understanding that my contentment is a mirage, a psychological bear trap set to console the person I was trying too damn hard to be. But in the seconds it took me to close the closet door, the contradicting mirror filled the room with defeat like the smell of its freshly blown out candle. That one's kind of just about the conversations we have with ourselves at 2 a.m. Um, this last one, I think I'm, I wanted to read it just because we're approaching the holiday season. Um, and that's always kind of a funny thing for me because uh, hopefully you'll realize after this, but I, I don't know, I'm just babbling now. Um, <laughs> imagination versus truth, how we pretend. Simmering in the disbelief of your loss, like when you were seven and found all your baby teeth stored away in an envelope of your parents' top bureau draw, you said, I've lost the ability to dream. I pretended I was still sleeping. Later that night, our pre-lit tree we hung ornaments in you, yourself, as punishment for lying to kids. Santa doesn't get around by way of reindeer, I explained. I thought I told you, you shrieked. It's the least we can do, I concluded. Without us, he doesn't exist. You pretended not to hear me through the shuffling of boxes and wrapping paper. Thank you. Thank you, Luke, for sharing that. That's like a continuance on, and it was perfect statement after the fact and continuing forward. So let's all be encouraged and uh, continue to move forward. It is a great pleasure to introduce uh, Philip Pesoros as the next reading poet. Welcome, Philip. What I am about to say is for all writers, poets, storytellers, and thinkers. There will come a time when your work will be questioned, criticized, and disapproved. Such a time came for me last month. When I read my poem, There, I Feel Better. During the intermission, I was called over to speak with an individual who expressed their disapproval of the poem. After explaining my thought process for how the poem was written, I could feel the coldness as my explanation was not acceptable. I went home, all the while feeling the sting of condemnation. Sitting at my desk, this poem was written as I shared my experience with a very good friend of mine, Mark Walsh, who said, or remarked, oh boy, well, good to know poetry is still dangerous enough to get those reactions. What I'm trying to say is write. Your emotions, whether in sadness or joy, anger, uncertainty, love, angst. And you might get it right the first time. Or rewrite after rewrite after rewrite. But always speak your truth. This poem begins with a bookmarked message that sits on my desk. And this is the bookmark. Name of the poem? Response and Damnation. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy for me, the sinner. The bookmark image sits with me as I write my thoughts, my emotions, the ink flowing through my fingers. Eventually, words, tone, the timber of my voice spills across the airwaves, rippling like a pebble thrown into a pond. With each ripple, a letter, into a word, into a stanza that I stand upon and bear my nakedness. On this day and time, my words strike a chord and not the heavenly alleluia with an individual 
who would send me straight to hell. 198 words and one word would send my mortal soul to eternal damnation. God damn. Oh, that's the word. God damn. Not shit show, pissed off, shit's creek, or Charlie Sheen. But glossing over the line, I wonder who is going to save me. Apparently, not this individual. He is that he is he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. Amen. Thank God my eternal soul is in flowing through my fingertips. Words elevate, voices resilient, rippling infinite, rippling infinite. What price do we pay for our salvation when all our sins are washed away? Amen. This poem is a life lesson. I forgive you. Wow. Thank you for sharing, fellow. And that is the theme base, everyone has a voice. And it's not just about voicing your words, but also understanding that uh, in areas of communication, it means interpretations, it means understanding, and it means uh, being humble in, in many ways in figuring out what's the best way to respond, to cre be creative, and share your very expression. So thank you for that, Philip. All righty, well, I would like to invite Jonathan Stroud to come up and now present and share, and thank you for feeling the vibes to share. <laughs> Just while I was sitting here and just inspired by all you guys, uh, just, just came out. So uh, the title is Don't Cry. I thought I saw you the other day, my whole continent's full of joy. They looked like you and stood like you. I wanted to run and embrace you again. Like rain in a drought, suddenly I realized. I took a breath as if stolen away, then a double take. And finally, like a gate knocked on at an odd hour, the familiar five stages of grief hit like a reverb. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance like a cycle or framework. My heart as if in a steel-like grip, learning to live without the one I lost. I held back a tear and then wanted to fall and told myself, don't cry. Thank you, Jonathan. And um, we're going to get ready to move forward. And in moving forward, I have the privilege to introduce our youth poet that's going to be reading. And uh, before I go forward, I want to stop for a moment, Jonathan. I thank you for sharing that. And I thank you, Thomas, for bringing this uh, spontaneity uh, swirl ahead. But last month, I was not able to be here. And the reason being was because I had lost my mother. And in doing so, I thank God because I was, I'm very pleased and humble because I have faith in spirituality and I understand that through prayers and her belief as Trish stated through her faith in Jesus Christ, I'm open-minded, I'm interfaith, I respect all faith, beliefs, and religions and non-faith. I'm just sharing my faith in why I wasn't present. And in doing so, I took a moment and I thank Philip um, for uh, putting me uh, in as a poet as opposed to hosting because actually it was predestined because it was right on time. And it just put me into the position to, to read a poem during that uh, Voices of Diversity. So before I introduce Vania Valsi, I only think it's right to share the one poem that I dedicated to my mom on the Voices of Diversity because it is the holiday season and I am full of joy with great spirit and great faith because I understand what she did was migrate to this country to, for, to realize that the American dream was actually birthing the children that she has in this nation. I am Hispanic and I am born in the city of Cambridge. So I'm going to read my poem and then I'm gonna go right into Venia Balsi with great pleasure. Okay. So this is a little story of, of what my mom in the realization what her journey of life was on this earth before she left October 3rd, 2021. Immigrant to immigrant. An immigrant is someone who leaves their country and puts down 
and I leave their country and their people say, you have left us, now you are an immigrant. Just to land, now referring to my mom and many others that come into the United States of America, when you put down your flag, you're picking up the American flag, you are now considered an immigrant. So the poem is Emigrant to Immigrant by Ali Brioso. Emigrant to immigrant, putting down my native flag to pick up another, is this the American dream? Two faces of pride and glory filled with sadness. Culture shock, many questions running through my head. This is madness. Oh where, oh why, following the steps of my brother, consider this to be an immigrant, consider to be an immigrant as I leave my motherland behind. This land is your land, this land is my land. This, so they say as I become an immigrant. Immigrant to immigrant, putting down my native flag to pick up another, is this the American dream? Fair skin I am with straight black long hair and slender hips. My mouth opens wide as I speak, not your language, but mine. My mom spoke Spanish. Thrusting forward to claim my American dream, stopped by a force of human nature, I find myself standing in line. Immigrant to immigrant, putting down my native flag to pick up another, is this the American dream? What is this you speak not English? Go to where you belong in these United States of America. Pushed into the pool of mixed race Latinos, we are different, I say, in these United States of America, Central American, Caribbean, South American, Latinos. Immigrant to immigrant, putting down my native flag to pick up another, is this the American dream? Who are you and where am I? Not in this country, I thought. You are brown and I am white, but we are Latinos. Not black or white, separation, segregation. What is wrong with this nation? Stay close to me and I to you. We won't be bought. We are the same even though we are not alike in these United States of America. Immigrant to immigrant, putting down my native flag to pick up another. Is this the American dream? Close together we came as one, as we were told, birthed in three beautiful Hispanic children of two Latino cultures. Ever so more deciding to be bold, standing tall, firm in all, went back in line to take what has now become mine, the right to be an American in these United States of America. Immigrant to immigrant, putting down my native flag to pick up another in this American dream. My mother became a US American citizen, and that's what the line that it refers to. So I am Hispanic, a Salvadorian Dominican, and they're totally two different cultures, and I'm even learning my Dominican side now at this phase of the best time of my life, as it was stated in a, a poem <laughs> early on. So with that being said, thank you very much. Um, I do have mixed culture children, which are now Hispanic, of mixed cultures in black uh, here, uh, black American. And I say that because my son, I say, our attends New Heights Charter School. So it's, I'm very proud to welcome a New Heights Charter School student. I did show Mr. Cunningham this flyer. I was like, do you know this face here? They're like, that's Venya Valsi. I said, sure enough, it is. So Venya Valsi is a 17-year-old girl who is in both high school and college. She attends New Heights Charter School of Brockton and Massasoit Community College. And that, I have to pause there because I've, I've witnessed um, another family that I referred to when they first started and the son graduated that you actually graduate from New Heights Charter School with a high school diploma and an associate's degree. Wow. So you're halfway through your college life once you graduate New Heights Charter School. So, with that being said, Venya has been writing poetry since elementary school. I think I'm gonna buddy you up with my son because he came home one day recently and he said, Mom, I don't like poetry. I said, who's teaching at New Heights Charter School? I have to go introduce myself and support my colleague, Philip Osaurus, who's outreaching to the school, and let's spice it up. But now that I see Venya's here, she can bring up a little bit of that spice in diversity into their poetry classes with her colleagues. So her favorite type of poetry has always been slam poetry due to its sense of authority and powerful impact. Slam it on, welcome aboard, and come and use your poem. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm so happy to be here as the youth poet. Uh, I have several poems that I will be reading today, and I hope that you guys enjoy it. So my first poem, 
I wrote this in uh, during the pandemic in 2020, during the George Floyd uh, situation, how everything was going down, and I felt in my spirit to write this, so I wrote this poem. The name of this poem is called Wide Awake. One justice, one race, one view, wide awake. Privilege is one way to call it. Corruption is another, wide awake. You are valued once you walk and talk like the uneducated, wide awake. We are shot by hate, stabbed by lies, cut by color, and killed by justice, wide awake. Fear is used as an excuse for hatred and a cover up for freedom. Color drips down the road of innocence, fear. Cream drips down the porch of corruption. Murder, wide awake. Authority is promised to those who have blinded equality. Death is preceded to those who have, who have been deaf to the blinded, wide awake. Do not believe in the American dream for the dream cannot even be provided to Americans. Wide awake. Wide awake is what we are. Fully asleep is what they want us to be. The next poem that I wrote is called The Ones That Promised. The law of the land that they promise us through their tongues. Getting our hopes up like a kid banging on the drums. Life is what they promise as if life was something that had to be established. Life is a priority, not an option. Liberty is what we stand for. Liberty is all that we ask for as we raise our hands and say no taxation without representation. Property, <laughs> I'm ashamed to say, property was taken away from those who had to dig their hands in dirt until they grabbed the gold. All these things that they spit at us and we still have to pump our fists. Colors that we have on our bodies are looked at as if it made us worthy or not. So what then must we say to the ones who promised? Nothing. Because the one who promised had a selective view. The next poem that I have is called, What Triggers? The trigger of pain when pain is disregarded. Water drips from within while outside is dry. What triggers when triggers are disregarded? You are, they always say, when they don't know who you are is. Visual blindness and personal arrogance is what they display. What triggers when triggers are disregarded? Cracked sidewalks mean, while footprints are still implanted in them. The trigger of pain when pain is disregarded, when water drips from within while outside is dry. What triggers when triggers are disregarded? This next poem I wrote, this poem resides with me and my spirituality as a Christian. Um, so this poem, the name of this poem is called All Right. It will be all right is what they always said, even when they saw the wall crumble on your head. It will be all right, I told my younger self, even though I cried to sleep. 
He sees you is what my mind holds on to through the past when I weep. It will be all right even through the darkness of hate where people see nothing but who you aren't. But that one person who sees you through it all. The moment when you decide to wrap yourself around a dirty blanket except to fall and not get up, except to give up. Your success is over and it's not all right. The rain pours on your head because you are chosen. One day you will see the sun. You will be all right. You fall and get bruised because you were chosen. You would not stay on the ground forever. You will be all right. Your tears will keep going because we live in a world of evil. But when every tear, but with every tear you will grow stronger. And that is when you will know everything will be all right. So I have two poems left, two poems left. And this poem also resides with me in my spirituality. But this one, it goes through a journey. So the title of this is I. Misunderstood, confused, redeemed. Head down, slouched shoulders, finding out what exclusion is. Rocks beating like drums to the symphony of your innocence. Pointed fingers, laughs that can be heard from Haiti. Kicks from the popular and punches from the unknowing. A shift of character for the redemption of popularity. Never walked in I, but misused me. Heard laughs of daylight, but saw the tears of nighttime. It is funny how experience will stop you from addressing you. Hmm. I was blind, but now I can see. I don't have to limit my calling to the existence of pain in the scroll of society. Why must I cry you a river when I can walk you a lesson? Ooh. Original isn't my name. No wonder you stand mouth wide open with shock running through your veins. I am in this world, but not of it. I was once blind, but now I can see. And for my last poem, for my last poem, I want every single one of y'all to listen. Because this is about y'all. This is a time for you guys to reflect. So the title of this poem is Who Are You? Who are you? Must you continue to walk in expectancy or trapped in a box that is as deep as your confusion? Must you be approved of your eye? Silly laugh, late night cries that shatter every window pane. Really, reality masked up. Pretty face, empty heart. Who are you? Must I remind the dove of its purity? Its feathers that are as white as snow? Why must why must your heart forget your authority? Or did experience crush your dignity? Backward footsteps, lips of uncertainty, Instagram scrolling of images of fantasies, questioning thyself of a life that doesn't have your eye. Darkness in life is a reality. 
Light in your darkness is your goal. Must I remind you of what resides within you? Look up above, for he knew you in your mother's womb. So I will ask you once more, who are you? Shut your eyes and go. Thank you. Thank you again, Venya. And as I close out the, the hosting for my part in this segment, I just want to say that at times you're always stating encouraging the youth, but at times us adults need the youth to encourage us yes. because we are paving the way for them. And what we've gone through in life, it's a beautiful entity, Venya, for you to be aware and thank you for your parents' love and support and faith. But when you reference Haiti, that says it all in your story. For, for the, that's your cultural experience. We are all different. We are all different in many ways. But our journey of life is given from being first placed in the womb. We, you were assigned to who you are, to who you were go, who you're going to become the color to your hair to your eyes to your ethnicity and culture we are embracing one another through this holiday season and as we close we always want to prepare for new year's resolution so i take today a great uh honor and opportunity to rejoin the everyone has a voice group because it's just a way how you should close the year with the awareness the encouragement the motivation the great fall feel youthfulness and now i'm going to pass this forward to philip because there is an adult featured poet and to be continued as i pass it along to him welcome philip so let's give a big hand to vanya volsi i think we were just taken to church So it is my pleasure to introduce our feature poet, Mr. Robert Knox, as a poet, fiction writer, and Boston Globe correspondent. As a contributing edit editor for the online poetry journal, Verse Virtual, his poems appear regularly on that site. They have also appeared in journals such as the American Journal of Poetry, New Verse News, and others. His poetry chapbook, Gardeners, Do With It, Do It With Their Hands Dirty, was nominated for a Massachusetts Best Book Award. He is the winner of the 2019 Anita McAndrews Poetry Award. He is also the author of Sasso's Lane, a novel based on the Plymouth origins of the notorious Sacco and Vanzetti case. He has been a very very good friend to everyone has a voice and we appreciate his words and his voice. Please welcome Robert Knox. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, maybe a little different. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, around the time a few years ago when I started writing poetry after not having uh, done that for a long time, my wife and I also started uh, building from literally nothing a flower garden in uh, Quincy, uh, where we live at home. Plants not only gave me something to write about, they gave me a lot of time to think while working outdoors. Uh, these poems were the result. I'm going to read just three of them out of, out of, out of, out of this book. Uh, this is called Out Outdoor Living. We make of nature another room, a big room if we have a big space, an ordinary room if the space is small. Make it comfortable, decorate a little, make a place to sit, a place to eat, a place to cook, conditions permitting, the sun shining, the breezes light, all this works best if the weather is right. Here's a clue for me and you. 
Wait for the sun to warm things up. Warm is desirable for living outdoors. Come on out or in. Look, we have company. It's the plant family. <laughs> Work with them. We can't beat them even if we tried. Something beautiful will grow up between us. See, what did I just say? It's starting. We can't escape it. We too are made of earth. We want to live outdoors. Pass the wine. Pick the strawberries. Drop your fig leaf, honey. You have dirt beneath your fingernails. Ah. Uh, okay, this is called the scripture of nature. Uh, the Bible, of course, in the Bible, life begins in a garden. We don't have snakes in our garden, but we have squirrels. <laughs> and this, 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 is, this is written uh, during the autumn season. Some nonchalant immortal turns the page to autumn. On cue, sweet day slips off her shawl, growing warm, sultry, reminiscent. The husband walks in the garden in shirt sleeves, thinking of nothing. Everything is semi-shade now, the sun at half-mast. The morning glory explores its name. Blooms clinging to the house like a band of nervous orphans. Blue-purple blue asters peak, already penciling in their winter vacation. Somewhere you won't see them. Toad lilies are not yet ready to change their spots. A single cricket keeps up a cracked tenor solo, a late phase song. He studied all the great romantics. Give him a few more degrees of autumn's comeback love, and he makes up with the universe. Gotta sing, gotta sing. High up in the gathering season, a squirrel beeps his barking little horn, squawking at the cat, black and disinterested, who plays possum with time. And so it is written that a walk in a garden is a prayer routine. Natural places are thought sinks, emotion sinks, agitation sinks. They absorb the world's disturbances. Walking on the equipoise of the year, we tread like garden monks of peerless devotion. But who invited that tacky squirrel? <laughs> a little silly at the end there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and this is the title poem for this book uh, called Gardeners Do It With Their Hands Dirty. And it uh, begins with a, a quotation from a uh, once famous gardening book called The Gardener's Year by Carol Kopeck, written in 1929. Oh, Gardening nice. is the kind of thing that comes back into, uh, into fashion every hundred years or so. You must come to see me, he says. I will show you my garden. Then, when you go, just to please him, you will find him with his rump sticking up somewhere among the perennials. Dot, dot, dot. All right, this, this is where I start. <laughs> I do it because it is out of doors, because I can, because you can do it alone. And you need very little, but not nothing. You need a growing season. Why, what am I doing in New England? I take no prisoners, I take no shit, except out of the manure bag. And you need growing things, creatures willing to grow. Any volunteers? Let me tell you about spring. When the earth looses its madmen and ambitions grow like weeds. No, that would take too long. Summer, then. Summer is ravishing, ecstatic, nature on steroids. Summer is falling in love, wild, messy, overheated, lush, inebriated, too damn short. In addition to which, nothing you do then is ever good enough to satisfy the wild sense of possibility you smell like the desire of the stamen for the honeybee's many hairy legs. And even if it were, you can't stop time. So at the end, when it's all in the rear view mirror or all in your head, make believe even, when, you're, when you are sobering down with a good glass of hoar frost and a fresh delivery of number two heating oil, in the garden, even then, death is beautiful. Autumn is beautiful, like death. Life is only valuable, remember, because we die. If you don't believe that, Imagine life without flowers, families without babies. We are obliged to be happy, as the rabbis tell us. We look at the fading asters 
or the Montauk daisies, or the furtive, modest, ravishing anemone, and realize with some degree of calm that we are all on our way in time, out of time, to the same place which, if we are lucky, will strongly resemble a garden. In the garden, I know that everything is forever and always was until it isn't. And even then, I'm hedging my bets because, understand, there's a garden metaphor for everything, even the things we haven't thought of yet. Wow. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read a couple more that are more recently written. Uh, this one is a story poem. It, it involves my father and World War II, but I don't need to tell the story because the poem does. Uh, poems, some poems, tell stories in condensed, concentrated fashion and convey strong emotion. That's what makes them a poem. The uh, poem references the name Leopoldville, uh, and because uh, that was a, a boat, a cruiser used as a troop transport during World War II, but it also is kind of a very sad reference because it was the name of a city in the, uh, during the, created by the Belgian exploitation of Central Africa. This is called Documentary Evidence. On some channel I never watch, I catch the Veterans Day dock in its last moments and pounce on the name of the transport ship snatching at details, fleetingly like the taunt of the witch in the old story I can never quite get enough of, the Leopoldville, and lose the thread at once. It sinks beneath the waters of my short-term whirlpool memory as the doomed vessel itself sends a thousand souls scurrying for their lives, finding instead cold water, last breaths. The transport, that one of three, that took the last bullet from the death-spiraling U-boat reign of terror, which plagued for half a decade the English Channel's thin ribbon of liberation. My father's regiment divided among three ships, dad catching one of the luckier transports, an entire line of Ancestry.com, a generation's destiny hanging on that chance. And here, before my tired eyes, while stretching in front of a TV, surfing while supine, the documentary evidence confirming a family survival story and remembering the survivor half a century later recount his perilous, fortunate escape from a plunge into all that cold water. The breadwinner who clung to the sandy shore in socks and shoes while his children squirmed in the foam like fish. Dad's brush with destiny confirmed on the screen. Survivors we are, not heroes. I stick to my fortunate course, grateful for the lucky draw. Anyway, a personal story. I don't know, does anybody recognize that photograph? You want to pass it around? That was a photograph that appeared in the uh, newspapers uh, last winter. This is a political poem. I don't know this person's name, and I don't want to know it. Here's the photo that ran in the newspapers uh, in the <laughs> around January 6th, and this poem is about the things that happened on January 6th. We all remember that day. Theater of the Vile. What is that thing on his head? <laughs> the lavishly furred flesh of some dead animal, considerably less harmful than its human executioner, but it's the smarmy round eyeglass frames, exactly like a pair I still own and care for like an aging pet, that draw me to his image as if he were a mocking brother, the absurd twin by way of an Oscar Wilde farce, then the black jumpsuit, with the surreally unapposite declaration of ownership, police, lettered in shiny white paint. The perfect touch of why do we call it black humor. The remainder of that dead beast, larger than grasped in the first awestruck glance, slops around the body. 
his shoulder, arm, trunk. He wears it like a man who has climbed inside a corpse and is pleased to find that it's no one he knows. And yet he holds, of all things, an unexpectedly harmless-looking thin bare pole, a toy prop as if whittled in the cesspool of his imagining for some childhood play of crossing swords with the kid across the street who is conveniently shorter and willing to endure a good piece of abuse from an older bully. Best of all, surpassing all absurdities, is the thoughtless, flat-eyed expression of some creature trying to find itself, its true face, in a crowd of potential, though uninspiring, followers. Who am I impressing, the face inquires. Who do they think I am? Is anyone out there looking at me? Ah. All right. Thank you. Another, uh, another topic, uh, again topical, a couple, uh, couple of poems from the uh, year of COVID uh, in, a, in a different, uh, obviously, emotional frame. Uh, anyway, this is about the death of a relative on, on my wife's side who was the same age as me. And she died not because of COVID, but during COVID time, uh, because of cancer. Uh, and when you're in the hospital during that time, people can't even come in to see you. Okay, so and I, I referenced some plants here. The Chinese peony. The Chinese peony is a small tree with large red flowers. And the forget-me-not uh, is the actual name of a plant with uh, blue flowers. This is called News of the Departed. I am growing a Chinese peony, not in a garden in the woods, but amid some trees. It produces offspring, this grandfather of my early efforts, young American peonies, still tight-lipped with promise. And everything close to ground is strong this spring, as if Earth's blanket dialed up its setting a notch. Violets, a vine with no name, but soft with a pore of tube-like purple flowers, Sweet woodruff, a throw of white eyes gathering beneath trees before they fully leaf. Vinca minor, opening shop in April, still lights on in the third week of May. And some forget-me-nots, like blue-eyed lovers. No, I think, I never will. Even the seeded grass from the city's contractor grew long green threads along the new white sidewalk, though she will never see it never set foot on its hard-hearted face. Whoever you have, love them. You never know when they will disappear. Wow. This one, uh, also a COVID year poem, but in a lighter vein. It's titled, Six Feet is All We Need. Generally speaking, I'm pretty good at keeping my distance. In fact, for days on end, I'm practically sheltering in place, possibly even self-quarantining, though I'm not sure where one of these nonce phrases leaves off and the other begins. I did, however, break solitude to stroll with my bestie to the post office, where she may well have violated her parole by engaging with a postal clerk over required freightage for an early draft of our tax returns. And then, totally on my own moral dime, for which I assume complete civic responsibility, we stopped at the nearly closed coffee shop, all its tables lying sideways against the wall where I most probably infringed upon the magic circle, pointing a blue surgically gloved finger at the blueberry scone, for which I felt a pounding need, transgressing that six foot safety zone, as if after all these years, needing, feeling compelled to foxtrot with the pastry of my choice, having discovered by the bane and boon of enforced separation 
from my fellow creatures that all we ever need in life is six feet of safe and clean and healthy air, and at the end, those six feet under. Oh. Uh, and if you will put up with it, one more uh, sort of sad outrage poem uh, set in one of those terrible Trump years, the year when we were seeing photos of children in cages along the country's southern border. Uh, this poem is based on and follows from a famous World War II poem by German Lutheran pastor Martin Niemöller about Nazi Germany called First They Came. Uh, and so I titled this, this poem, They Came, because I used the same refrain. Uh, it's one of the few times this is classic poetry device, the refrain. You repeat things. A number of you people use, the, the, use this the, uh, uh, framing device in, 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 in your poems as well. First they came for the immigrant children, and we looked away, because the leaders toady told us, those are not our children. And we looked at our own children, and were reassured. Then they came for the people who cover their heads, or pray too much, and again, we looked away, because we were not Iranians, or Iraqis, or Gazans, or children of the West Bank, detained indefinitely without charges, and as the man said, those are not our children. Then they came for the abused and for those who accused their abusers and for the accusers' advocates and for those who fought against their abusers. But we looked away and jested at the comedy humane because we were not ourselves the victims of abuse or the advocates for the abused. And after all, we are not his type. Then they came for the ones who would never play ball with their leader, the ones who would always be trouble because they were cheated out of their land or perchance had been enslaved or who had once owned a country that the slave owners wished to possess for themselves or who we feared were willing to work for too little money or who loved the wrong people. And then because no one else remained standing in our diminished patria, neither advocates nor scribblers with their pencil over their ear, nor enemies of the people with their handheld devices, nor the party of the workers, nor defenders of the beaten, humiliated and disappeared, nor anyone able to kick the ball from their feet. Nothing was left for us to do but to lay our own bodies down before those feet as the painted, spiked, and horny-headed demons of extinction cheered and drank and laughed and danced upon the bodies of their victims and ran up history's score. Wow. Okay, I've got, I think, just two more. Uh, this is uh, another story poem. This is based on something that happened way out in the country in Berkshire County. This is in a much different mood, at least. Uh, it's called The Bear at the Bottom of the Driveway. Not actually the bottom, but where the blacktop swerves almost at a right angle on its leafy way to Mackinac Road, that pleasant artery named for the people replaced by those who built the road. The trash can belonging to the house at the driveway's bend is empty now, and perhaps our black bear has failed to make its acquaintance in its more fetchingly odorous state, as no debris is visible. But the creature, larger now than when last I made his acquaintance, is snorfling contentedly in a wallow of wild roughage, not far from the hard man-thing container, and wholly visible from the back end of my car, which I am about to load with inedibles, clothing, laundry, 
his and her laptop computers, and, how could I forget, some garbage of my own. We exchange a look, then each goes back to his business. Mine, mine, the popping of the trunk and the loading of luggage, happily not too fragrant. The visitor moving his feeding station a few steps to the other side of some thinly leafed brush, agreeing to disagree with my disaffection for his presence, but not doing anything truly about it. Two minutes later, as I bear a second load for the trunk, a car rolls up the drive and parks in front of the trash can house, a mere few feet from the bear, still unambiguously present, the car blocking my view of the scavenger. When the driver emerges, I call what I believe to be a salient observation. There's a bear on the other side of your car. <laughs> he responds, I know. Not knowing what else he might know or not know, I attempt a pitched voice dialogue at uneasy distance. The man too far for talking, the bear too close for comfort, unwilling to take a single step toward our visitor while not entirely clear on the nature of our relations. To my neighbor, I draw attention to the trash can, implying a preference for its removal. The other's replies are brief and unapologetic, as if waiting for me to advance a quarrel, a thing I do not easily do, whether an interested bear is listening or not. Minutes later, the car loaded for the trip, the long trip home, we roll down the drive to the swerve and glance up as the man, a woman, and a little girl lean on the railing of the house's abbreviated deck, gazing down in wonder at the bear, in what appears to be the rapture of the innocents, as if they have utterly no inkling that they are the creatures in our zoo. Ah. Okay. All right, I'm coming to the end here. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is a poem about spring, which I haven't really read too much about yet, I guess. Uh, it uh, and it, it, this also takes off from a line in an, in another poem by an early 20th, 20th century poet named Rainier Maria Rilke, uh, and uh, this is the line that I uh, that I started with. Uh, it is spring again. The earth is like a child that knows poems by heart. And that's from uh, Rilke's poem called The Songs of Orpheus, number 21. Uh, okay, here's me. The earth is like a younger brother who follows his son around, copying his ways, rising from the ground each day, who turns from his eternal defeat to eternal recurrence. Like the child who refuses to take a nap when his ca cankered eyelids are weighted down with the heavy visors of fatigue. It is spring again. The earth tulips his favorite rhymes. The earth demands to stay up late, to be feted with sweetmeats and sugar pops. The earth is a child who stays home from school, who endlessly sings his favorite ads, who speaks truth to raindrops, who steals cigarettes from sleeping uncles, who plays silly songs from 20 years ago on devices of his own devising that only indulgent babysitters know, who hides Brother Winter's favorite toys and refuses to give them back until Christmas, a child who demands a pet to stay up late, to eat dandelions and green berries for supper, to know a secret and hear a brand new story every night, who demands to be heard. In spring, the earth demands to be president, that his team always win, that the wind blow only at his back, that green berries turn blue or red as required, that old songs be sat upon his knee to sing old men back from tired labors, to scround among barbs and brambles, and smell only of lilac in May 
in spring, the earth is born yesterday and will live forever. Wow. Thank you. So quite an afternoon we were taking to church. We got our hands dirty. We had a little potty mouth. We heard from our youth, from our elders, and everyone in between. Uh, let us thank Mr. Robert Knox as our feature. Vanya Volsi, student teacher. Everyone on the open mic, give yourself a hand, please. Um, I'd like to thank my co-host, Ale Brioso. <laughs> Director Paul Engel for giving us this space, this beautiful space. So thank you for everyone who came to listen because what do we do here? Everyone has a voice. Everyone has a voice. We will be back next month with Laura Brown and Amelia Engel, December 18th at 2 o'clock. So have a great month, and we will see you next month. And a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you, Vanya Rossi, for joining us here for an interview with Everyone Has a Voice. This is the After Fact. After such great poetry reading, powerful, shall I say, poetry reading that you have read as a student youth featured poet. I'm going to ask you a few questions, uh, Vanya, and uh, I'm going to uh, let you tap into yourself and then give me uh, your feedback on it. Okay. So for, uh, let's go right into the first one. When did you first realize you wanted to be a writer? Um, I first realized that I wanted to be a writer uh, about eighth grade, eighth grade. Uh, I realized I wanted to be a writer because that's when I truly tapped into the type of poetry that I liked. And once I tapped into that, it made sense of uh, my mindset because I, I always refer to my mindset as a poetic mindset. So uh, once I tapped into that, I realized that I love writing, I love what I'm doing, and I just continued on. That's wonderful. So you found a way to express yourself. I think right. eighth grade, getting ready to go into high school, that could have been uh, some of the fears, or as if you were already empowered, just figuring out what is the best way to you can express yourself as being who you are as an individual. Right. That's very nice. What does your family think about your writing? Um, my family, my, my mom and my dad, is actually uh, the ones that have read my, my writing before, and they're extremely supportive, uh, couldn't have asked for better support. Uh, my mom has been uh, through it since the beginning, so she's seen my writing, she's seen my uh, poetry, uh, my lack of frustration when I can't get it right. So uh, I would give her the poem, let her read it, and she has always given me smiles and encouragement and uh, always told me to keep going because it's truly a, a, a gift to have. Yes, definitely, definitely. As a faith believer, it is a gift. And as a mom myself, that's one of the best things you can do for your children. And the beauty of it is, I'm quite sure, is the heartfelt of your family and parents, especially your mom, is to see the growth in right. you because you are now going to be graduating soon, right? Yeah, yeah so that that's, means there's a lot of involvement and you have great future prospects in, in the future college experience. And has your idea of poetry changed since you began writing a poems now that you're at, at, uh, a senior in high school? It has changed. Um, because when I first started, I, I started, or I got exposed to poetry in elementary. That's when I technically started writing poetry, but it was always one type of poetry that w I was exposed to. So I didn't know about uh, free verse or slam. I knew only about rhyme scheme and, and rhyming your poems. And I'm not really a rhymer. Right. So uh, when I was exposed to that type of poetry, I didn't really, uh, even if I dove into it, I didn't really express myself the way I was supposed to. So I thought poetry just had one element to it. Until, as stated before, when I went into eighth grade, that's actually when I entered New Heights. Um, that's when I got 
a, a, a broader, broader idea of poetry in different types. And that's when I was introduced to slam poetry. And there was a club that did slam poetry uh, with one of my English teachers. And that's when I tapped into it. So uh, once I did that, I understood that poetry could be powerful right. and impactful. And poetry is one of those uh, uh, literally literal devices that you can use to impact an uh, audience without being literal. It right. has a deeper meaning. It, it does, and that's where you can actually practice the freedom of speech and be creative about it. And with that being said, uh, when you talk about the audience, uh, are you on social media now, and how does that affect your writing? Um, I am not on uh, social media, but the way that I do express my writing is through um, this platform and also uh, school. I write a lot of poetry, send it to school, send it to Massasoit and other communities where they can read it and be um, empowered by what I have to say. And also when I have the opportunity to be interviewed or uh, talk on, on, on YouTube or a podcast, I also uh, allow my voice to be heard and speak poetically. That's, that's very well stated. And if you could pass along one piece of advice for our young writers, what would it be? Be you. If, if I could tell anybody, my younger, the younger version of myself, or any young person that was to want advice from me, it would definitely be, be you and never be afraid to express yourself, no matter your religion, no matter your color you are still equal and you still have a voice. If you have a voice, use it, you feel me? So I feel like our, our young people, especially the new generation that's about to come, we, can't, we have to, first off, acknowledge our, our, our stance and acknowledge our circumstances now so we can properly move forward. And once we have the right mindset to do so, we will be able to not only be united, but be impactful. I think, uh, Vanya, I think that you um, did very well. I think that you have a lot to give to our community here, De definitely a vibrant, diversified community. On behalf of everyone who has a voice and encouraging the youth, I definitely want to encourage you to come back and uh, take opportunities of the open mic so you can continue reading your poetry and expressing yourself here amongst our, uh, the the Brockton Public Library, but we also have the videos on uh, the local uh, cable network, which can share for those viewers that are not here. I definitely would like to continue on myself uh, independently uh, in support of Philip Hesaurus with what he does in the community and other uh, initiatives that are taken in the community uh, that I feel like you have a lot to, uh, to give more in the city of Brockton. So I definitely want to continue to encourage you in the um, freedom of speech, powerful, power of words, uh, that strong character you have. And uh, most just want to be thankful for you on this holiday season. Thank, Thank you, Vanya Velocity. It was a great pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. So Robert, uh, what was an early experience when you learned that language had power? Um, I remember writing. I remember writing poems in the second grade. You know, and uh, they all rhymed, and it was about uh, he and she climbed a tree, and they met a bee, and oh we, and you know, something like that. So I don't know. People seem to respond to it, 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 it like your teacher. You know, kind of said, "Oh," or something. You know, that was cool. So uh, ah, right. Maybe impressing adults or something that you could be able to speak. Maybe that was it. All right. So uh, how long did it take you to actually start sharing your poetry? Oh, well, I actually first did it in my 20s, after uh, a couple of years after graduating from, uh, from college. And uh, uh, I don't know, I just realized that I, just writing stuff was what I wanted to do. And uh, even though I was, it was clear that, you know, writing a poet doesn't, writing poetry doesn't, uh, is it making a living? So you kind of had to do something else. But I, wa I wanted to write, and then um, and I moved. I moved to uh, Boston, then Cambridge, Massachusetts. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, 
poets were kind of thick on the ground. You know, you, you, could, you, could, you could run into them pretty much everywhere. So a group of us formed together, and we shared poetry among each other as kind of like workshop sessions. And they said, oh, let's publish some of this. So we actually had a little publishing cooperative for a while and uh, you know, put out a paper product. Looked like a tabloid paper. Tabloid papers were sort of new or interesting at that time. There was Boston, there was the Phoenix and the real paper. In New York, there had been the Village Voice or something. It was just, it was just the shape of them. It was different. It wasn't like regular newspaper. But uh, we did that for a couple of years. All right. Uh, so Robert, how do you think you've evolved as a writer over the years? <laughs> uh, I've gotten better. <laughs> Mostly, yeah. Um, uh, I uh, I was just interested in writing um, writing fiction also, but uh, so I uh, uh, I sort of put poetry on the uh, on, on the shelf for a while, and I spent a lot of time. Uh, I, w I was a teacher. Uh, I was uh, teaching English composition as an adjunct faculty in various colleges, including Massasoit Community College for a while in Brockton. That was like one of my, one of my uh, one of my jobs. So, uh, whenever I didn't have to work, I would be working on a, a story or a novel or something like that. And uh, then I uh, got into newspapers, and uh, that actually gave me writing as kind of like the job. That's what you were doing. Right. I wasn't teaching and grading pe papers. I, I was writing, and that was like just sort of like good for me to say. To realize that basically you just, if you wanted to write, you just wrote. <laughs> you just had to like make the time to do it. I would come home uh, late at night. I would get a, you know, before going to work the next morning or something. I would write a little bit. I would like pr produce the novel that way. Uh, and uh, I, I, I wrote a novel based somewhat on my newspaper experience living in the town of Plymouth, Massachusetts, and um, that that was published. Uh, I don't know. 2016, about five years ago. And so that was, that was an encouragement, too. And as I said today, I, I don't know. As my life got a little less filled up with work and stuff, and I had more time, and we were planning this garden, and I started writing poetry again regularly and realized sort of like how important it was to me. So it's been a long, slow evolution is what it would be. All right. So um, what are some of the influences that have inspired you as an individual? Uh, I, I uh, actually uh, am very fond of the old uh, English and American poetry and literature canon. Uh, I mean, lately I've been inspired by uh, the poetry of Walt Whitman, uh, America's sort of first great founding original poet from the 19th century. Um, I became a, a fan of the uh, of Henry David Thoreau also uh, his great love of nature and uh, embrace of the of the universe. The universe is that is God. We're all part of it, uh, and uh, between it is both a science and uh, sort in a, in a kind of metaphysical way too. Uh, so uh, you know that point of view. It's like uh, you know there's a great miracle that happens. Every day, I mean, you wake up and like, maybe you're not up to see the dawn like Thoreau is and was every single day. But wow, it came up again. You know, we're here again, and and the world exists once again. I'm I'm conscious. And then if you you know manage to make it through the day as most of us do most of the time, at the end there's another miracle. The sun goes down. Wow, how does this happen? Okay. So. If you, could, if you could pass along your advice for poets or anyone considering the arts, what would it be if you could pass any advice? Yeah, you, yeah, you, you just have to, you, you have to stick to it. You, okay. The, the, the thing that people have said about writers that, that I've heard that makes sense is that uh, you only sort of like become a writer if you have to do it. Mm. It's, it's not like, well, maybe I'd like to do that, but I have a regular job. You, have a, you may have a regular job to live, but you're writing because you have to. And I imagine that works the same way with uh, the visual arts or painting or making a movie or being a musician or, you know. Uh, uh, there's another thing that I read once that stuck with me always. I'm not 
sure if, if, if it could be quantified quite this much, but uh, somebody wrote a whole book about looking at people from the Beatles to, uh, I don't know, you know, famous writers and, and, and artists and things. You have to put in your time, and their, their time was 10,000 hours. You have to put in your 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. That's when you start to get good. Well, that's, in my case, that took a long time. But in anybody's case, it's going to be a serious commitment. You know, so it's like, you know, it's, you, you want to be an artist, you want to be a musician, you want to be a, an actor, you, you, you want to be a, a filmmaker or something, you, you, know, you, have, you, you just you keep doing it, you keep working at it. All right. So uh, social media has evolved. And um, how does social media affect your writing? Uh, it gives you a, uh, an outlet for publication. Uh, that, 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 that's been the main, the main thing. I mean, I have a Facebook page and I, you know, either I, I put up poems or uh, I put up like publications, this poem has been appeared so-and-so or this story appeared so-and-so and, -so, and I, I spread it around that way. Uh, it's, I don't know if it's exactly social media, but the fact that there are all of these online outlets for publication right, definitely. Right enables you to get your work out in public a whole lot easier than it was. I love paper, I love books, but uh, a whole lot of times where I'm, where I'm publishing poetry is, is, is online. Uh, it, it's not really social media, but it is an online um, group. Uh, is it, it, the poetry community that I am part of is called versevirtual.org, sorry, used to be .com, versevirtual.org. And uh, the uh, editor that started it said, well, well, I'm looking for contributing editors. And that's pretty much how I began in more recent years uh, publishing reg regularly is uh, he said, well, you know, uh, if I want you to be a contributing editor, and that means basically I'll put your poems into my online journal and it comes out every single month mm -hmm. that, you know, Literary journals come out like four times a year or maybe twice a year or something like that. You know, that's that in the, in the paper world. But, you know, you can do it differently online. And it's sort of, act, it's, it's kind of, it's only social media in the sense that we're a community among ourselves and it's an online community. I communicate with people that live in California right. and Chicago and Midwest and New York City and, you know, hardly any of them live in Boston or, you know, Massachusetts, frankly. You know. So it's been important. All right. Thank you, Robert. That's all. Hey, great.